So JB Friday is the extension forestry. Um, is it is the extension forestry UH at Manoa Sitar. He has been in his position and has worked for over 22 years. And he has worked in agroforestry, coral forestry, and for the past six years, a large part of his job has been focusing on rapid rohia death. So today, JB will be sharing about what they've learned in the past years about rapid ohia and protecting our ohia forest with all of you folks. Rapid Ohia Death, JB Friday, I'm Extension Forest of the Cooperative Extension Service. And this is the second webinar of Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness Month. Um, go to the DOFA website under the Invasive Species and check out all the events. There are events happening all month long on this. When I talk about rapid Ohia Death, I say we, we, we. I don't want to imply that I am directing all of this. We have a large group of people led by UH, the Forest Service, USDARS, and others working on rapid ohia deaths. When I say we, I mean the large group of almost 100 people that are working on this part, you know, as part of their jobs. For people chiming in here, I'm guessing most people are pretty familiar with Hawaii and familiar with ohia. Um, that it's our, our most important native tree in Hawaii in that it, it's cover, it's the dominant tree in most of our um, native forests here. It is endemic to Hawaii. It's very variable. There are many tax of Ohia, and that's another lecture, um, all the way from um, the coast up to the mountains. So this is an Ohia forest that I was fortunate enough to visit in Puna in 2005. Um, it was on a cinder, so low elevation on cinder, nice tall Ohia forest all full of interesting endemic uh, plants on the under, underneath it. Um, really, and, and, and the owners had protected it by putting a fence around it. And this is what happened. So this is the worst case for rapid Ohia death. We've got easy 90% mortality here. There's one tree hanging in there. If you look on the left, um, maybe it's a resistant one. And we've taken a sample from that tree for the resistance testing program. But um, really it would happen. And then the understory, all got taken over by invasive plants uh, because all the sunlight got in. All right, briefly, and again, I'm assuming people kind of know what rapid ohia death is, but briefly, rapid ohia death is a fungal disease. It's a vascular wilt fungus. The fungi are in the genus Ceratocystis, which is a genus of worldwide pathogens. Um, it enters the tree through wounds in the bark and it grows in the sapwood. You don't see it on the outside. Um, it cuts off the water supply of the tree. That's why we get this, the whole crown of the tree turns brown and it turns all at once because the vascular system of the tree, the sapwood, is blocked up with this fungus. When the tree goes down, it grows down, goes down really quickly. You know, people look at it and go, hey, that tree was green last time I came by here last week. Now it's brown. That's why we named it rapid ohia death long before we knew what was going on. It is a super virulent pathogen. Um, it knocks out the most healthy trees in the forest, in the most healthy forests. Um, so it's not something it's just taking out the weaker, the suppressed trees. Um, in fact, we often find it takes out preferentially the tallest trees in the, in the stand. Um, there are other things that turn trees brown. Uh, herbicide will do that. Um, there are other diseases. So I, I do want to emphasize, we don't know the tree has rod unless we do a lab test. Now, the lab tests are, um, now these days, of course, the lab tests are DNA tests, and they found a fungus, they cultured it out, they said, hey, it was in ceratocystis, but um, which ceratocystis? There are, I forget how many, 50 different species of ceratocystis in the world, and they keep finding more ones. Um, Lisa Keith at the USDA and Wade Heller, um, who was working with her at the time, actually did the molecular analysis of it and found out we not only have one, we have two new um, ceratocystis in Hawaii, and um, they are um, unique to Hawaii, never found anywhere else, um, and they are not related. So a pretty complicated story here. They are probably, the two, three things could have happened. They could have been brought in and we just never discovered them somewhere else because they never caused problems. You know, we really don't know all the fungi in the world. There's a lot of different fungus in the world that we don't know what it is. Until something causes a problem, we don't track down what it is. Um, they could have mutated here or they could have hybridized here. Uh, there are other species of ceratocystis here in Hawaii. Um, and it turns out the two species, um, so the, the two species were given Hawaiian names. Ceratocystis leucoohia is the more virulent one and the one we'll be talking about mostly in this. Leuco, so I live in Hilo, 
why Luku is a destructive river. So Luku Ohia is the destroyer of Ohia. The other one is Ceratocyst is Huli Ohia, and you think about Huli the canoe at sea, the overturn, uh, upset, not, not Huli chicken. Um, that's the other one. Huli Ohia is uh, quite possibly been here longer um, and causing lower levels of disease. So that's my introduction on rapid Ohia death. I'm trusting that everybody participating here kind of knows about it, and I'm being light on the introduction today. What I want to do today is to give people updates pretty much on what we've discovered in the past year and where we're going with the whole rapid Ohia death program. Um, here's a map of incidences on the Big Island. You see most of the incidences, but not all, are Luku Ohia, which again is the most virulent species, um, the more virulent species of it. Um, we do see um, instances of the disease in pretty much every district of the island now. So it started on East Hawaii in the Puna district, moved to Hilo, and then it moved south around through Kau and up the Kona, and only more lately has it moved up to the Hamakua and the North Kohala districts. Um, we do see it everywhere on the island though. And um, I did not write down how many there are. There are some thousands of positive detections on Hawaii Island. Kauai Island is also being hit, but few enough detections that we have numbers of exactly how many detections. So 128 of Julio Hia and 95 of Luko Hia. Now, this is a puzzle. Why do we find both fungi on Kauai and on Hawaii Island and not in the middle? Um, were they separate introductions to the other islands? Uh, you know, we're, we're really, it, it is a puzzle why it isn't Kauai. And then Kauai right now, um, there are, as you say, there are some, a little over 200 detections on the big island, there are several thousand. Um, so a very much smaller thing, is Kauai going to take off or is it just not going to be a severe problem in Kauai? We don't know. Um, so the distribution on this is also, it's pretty interesting. Oahu only has Julio Hia. So Luku Hia is the more virulent uh, species of the two. Oahu, we only have five detections and we have Julio Hia. We would never have detected these trees as a problem. Five Ohia trees on the entire island that turned brown and died, unless we were looking. You know, and it's the folks on Oahu who are keeping their eye out, worrying about might it start in Oahu, only finding Julio Hia on the island. And only in two are in, in urban areas, three are up in the watersheds. Um, so very little on Oahu. Maui, um, even fewer. Only one detection ever was on Maui. They cut the tree down, they dug out the stumps, they made a bonfire and it's gone. So right now Maui, no no um, known incidences of either. Um, Molokai and Lanai, we have tested samples of dying ohia trees from those islands, but again, no positives on those islands. Okay, the two different pathogens cause two different diseases. The virulent disease is a wilt disease. And to a pathologist, a wilt disease is a disease that um, destroys the vascular system so the tree doesn't get any water. Um, so leukohia causes a wilt disease, huliohia causes a canker, and a canker is the fungus just grows under the bark and kills the tree and eventually girdles it and kills it. Um, the disease, the pathology has really been worked out by Mark Hughes, who's the guy in the beard here, and Jenny Juswick. Um, Jenny is a forest pathologist who looks, who's been looking at ceratocystis diseases on uh, the mainland, on oak trees and butternut, some other mainland trees. So she's really been able to come out here and bring her knowledge of how these diseases work to our diseases and explain um, how they work, how they move around, how they kill the tree. Internal symptoms of these trees, <clears throat> the fungus, you don't see it on the external, as I said, you see it in the sapwood. So when you cut into the tree, and these are all uh, trees that have leukohia, um, you see this black streaking in the sapwood. You don't see it very much in the heartwood. Again, the fungus is moving through the, 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 the sap, the spores move through the sap, so they colonize the sapwood, and then they move radially in and out a little bit, but they don't go in the heartwood because heartwood isn't moving water. That's what heartwood is. Now, a key point to this is the fungus can't go through bark. The fungus needs some sort of wound in order to infect the wood. It can infect roots. It can infect branches. It can infect everything down to like a two millimeter diameter branch, 
but it needs something broken to get through. If you just spray the fungus on bark, nothing will happen. What we are seeing is most areas where we're seeing um, infected trees, we're seeing those trees are injured or damaged somehow. One common way for trees to get um, injured or damaged is um, through animals peeling the bark off. So folks notice this tree turning brown down in Kau. If you look down at the bottom of the photo here, uh, you will see that the tree is growing on rocks. It's growing in the lava. There's no grass. There were a lot of feral goats in the area. They had peeled the bark off. When they went up to the tree and looked at it, they saw the fungus. So that black here is the fungus sporulating, the spores growing out of the wood. So it's all infected the wood where the bark was peeled off, the spores are growing on the surface of the wood. Um, that's how the tree got infected. On a landscape scale, and this is a little, this is a, a little more complicated map than I've shown before, but this is something that the park supplied to me uh, just last week. On a landscape scale, we have in many instances seen a lot of disease where you have a lot of feral animals, goats, pigs, sheep, cattle, and much less disease where you don't. Here's an example from the Kahuku unit of Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. Um, now the Kahuku unit has a fence lines blocking off the different areas. The lower part, so the part on the lower part of the picture down here has a lot of feral sheep and goats in it. And most of the detections of rot are down here below the fence line. When you look up here above the fence line, there are a few detections up there, but many fewer. So the story seems to be that the animals are damaging the trees and the damaged trees are getting rod. Um, if you go above the fence line, there's a lot less damage because there aren't animals. There are winds, you know, things fall over, uh, people build fences. There are other reasons the trees get injured or damaged, but it really seems that the high population of animals um, is damaging trees, is allowing there to be a lot of rapid ohia death. I'm sorry, I, I didn't explain. The red circles are trees that died and were tested positive for um, rapid ohia death. Um, either Luku or Juliohia. Um, the green circles are trees that died that were not tested positive. So again, there are a lot of things that kill Ohia trees in the world, um, but the red circles are the rod trees. The green circles are trees that look from the outside symptomatic, but something else killed them. All right, I hope you got that map down because this one is similar, but a bit more complicated. This is, you'll probably recognize this, this is a part of Hawaii Volcanoes National Park and Volcano Village on Hawaii Island. Um, the red circles are trees that, um, let's see, let me back up on here. So the, this shows um, areas that are fenced and ungulate free or unfenced. Um, the large red circles are trees that were shown to be symptoms and were tested and um, were, uh, did have rapid ohia death because they went to the tree, they took the sample, they found the rapid ohia death fungus. The green circles are trees that died in the sample, but they didn't find any fungus. Now, maybe they missed it. Uh, maybe they took a couple samples. A tree is a big thing. It's easy to miss it. Or maybe something else killed those trees. The small squares are trees that looked like they had symptoms from the air. So this area was surveyed um, from the air for rapid ohia death. And all the small, the small red and uh, purple squares are um, trees that from the air, but people didn't go to look at each one of those trees. So if you look at the map, the pattern that you see is through the areas, this is all state forest, unfenced. This is the village. This is private farms and ranches. This area here has been pretty much fenced for decades and pretty much ungulate free. Um, and there's only two symptomatic trees inside. This area is largely ungulate free, but you're finding some symptomatic ones inside and they did find some ungulate incursions more recently. Then this area up here, again, has been pretty ungulate free. So we're seeing the pattern side by side forest, the same forest, the same rainfall elevation, soil type, the same trees, the difference is a fence and where you have a lot of ungulates and where you don't. Um, and here, primarily it's gonna be pigs, whereas the Kahuku thing primarily was goats. So what's going on with the pigs? It's very possible that the pigs are digging up and damaging the roots as they root around and the fungus can get through the roots. We know from studies and pots in the greenhouse that the fungus can get through the roots if you damage the roots. If you, the studies have been with people poking the soil 
damaging the roots. We know the fungus can gum up the roots. So that's what we're thinking is going on in this. How does the pathogen move around? Um, the short answer is people, beetles, or wind. Um, people moving firewood can easily move the pathogen around. So you see those black circles around the sapwood and all these logs. So that's a pile of firewood in Pune. The owner of the pile is burning it right there, which is a good thing to do. He's using it in his wood stove on these cool, wet days, and he's getting rid of it, and that's good. But if he sent that firewood up to his friend in Kohala, he would have moved a lot of pathogen up there. So that's one way it can move around. Um, beetles, boring beetles, attack diseased trees. So when a tree gets the disease, it gets attacked by hundreds and hundreds of the boring beetles. Um, these make a lot of sawdust and the sawdust blows around the wind. We think that's a major way it moves around. Um, it's also possible that beetles directly going tree to tree move it. So in looking, we find a bunch of the, the, the beetles, they're both native and non-native beetles that do a lot of boring. The entomologists have been taking censuses of the beetles, but also collecting the sawdust that they produce. We find that the sawdust, if you apply that to a wound in a seedling, it will kill the tree. Um, so they're finding that. Do the beetles themselves actually carry the disease? Um, well, they did find about two and a half percent of the beetles that come out of infected ohia trees are carrying the fungus with them. Um, these are ambrosia beetles. These are beetles that culture fungus in trees, but the ceratocystis is not one of the fungi they eat. It's just because they, they, they drill through the trees here and they drill through the sapwood and they get the fungus on their shells. Um, and a few of them, as they emerge, um, they still have the fungus. And they, they were able to determine this because they cut logs, brought them into the lab, raised them in a mesh thing and caught the beetles as they came out and then analyzed the beetle for the DNA of the fungus and found that. Now, what if these beetles go into healthy trees? Could they infect the tree? Short answer is yes. And the way they found out about this was, um, this was Kyle Roy at USGS led up this study. They took those beetles that came out of the infected logs. Um, actually, no, they took the beetles and they ran them across a Petri dish so they would get the fungus on their feet. And they put them in these little plastic capsules and they glued it to the trees. The only way for the beetle out to get out was to drill through the tree. And sure enough, when you did that, it infected the tree. So the beetle, a beetle carrying fungus can infect a tree. How often it, that happens versus how often it's just a wound with a frass leaning it, this we don't know. But we do know it's possible for the beetles in, directly to infect trees. And we want to know that because in other pathosystems, that's a new word I have to learn for this, so ecological systems involving a pathogen, it is the beetle like Dutch elm disease. Um, it's the beetle that brings the fungus into the tree. So if you got rid of all the beetles, you'd get rid of the disease. Um, here we think it's probably not that, but this is part of the story. You know, it, when you mentioned Dutch elm disease, we've been studying Dutch elm disease for I think about 80 years and the elms are still dying and we're learning to manage it. We've been studying rapid ohia death for six. So we're really just learning a lot. Now, the beetles drill into the trees. There are trees that you can go up to a large tree in a particular area and they will just be sawdust all over the bowl of the tree. That sawdust blows around in the wind. If that sawdust lands on an injury, it can cause disease. So how much does it blow around? Well, we did a project where we had samplers all around the island, these two different kinds. One is what we call a rotor rod, um, which is this thing in the box that says G. The, uh, there's an arm on the top spinning and it has these glass rods on it and it picks up anything floating in the wind. Usually these are used to sample pollen um, in the wind, but it would pick up any of this frass and then the scientists were able to swab them and check for DNA for ceratocystis. The other sampler we had was a passive sampler. It's like this big wind vane and on the inside you have microscope slides with Vaseline on them. And again, it picks up anything that's floating in the wind um, on it. And they can test that for um, the ceratocystis DNA. Uh, Carter Atkinson led up part of this, Wade Heller, and then Tom Harrington at University of Iowa. Tom is a pathologist who studies ceratocystis around the world. So he is really the worldwide expert on this kind of disease. And he spent a lot of time out here helping our local scientists design and carry out uh, projects with that. So what we found is you can, on the big island at least, you can find ceratocystis DNA in the wind almost anywhere. They found it down at Hapuna, and that's a long way from any Ohia forest. 
what they were not able to do is find any live spores. So the DNA, a dead spore still has DNA. So you can pick it up from dead, from the maybe dead spores, decomposed, whatever. Um, but you're not finding live spores floating around. At least they weren't able to ever find anything live. So from all the samples they took, they tried to culture out the fungus and they weren't able to do it. Um, so that's what we're kind of thinking about that. How much can the wind blow it around and what concentrations do you need blowing around? And is that possible? That's our next step in figuring things out. Um, with this, we have Harold Thistle, who is a retired uh, modeler from US Forest Service. And he looked at things like dispersal of pollens, dispersal of pesticides and dispersal of fungal spores on the wind. Um, so he's working with people um, currently to look at what data sets we have about wind dispersal of things on Hawaii and then how he can build a model for the ceratocystis spores to use those, those data sets. Um, because of the volcano having gone off, well, uh, for the past 25 years here, I guess, there's been a lot of work on aerial dispersal of bog and vol volcanic particulates from the volcano. So the volcanic uh, the people at the USGS and the volcano have a lot of data on that, as do the UH Manoa climate folks. So we're getting a lot of um, interesting uh, answers on that. Um, a lot of data. We're getting a lot of interesting data on that. We hope that a model will be able to answer questions like, could it blow across the island? Could it blow between islands? Um, could it blow from Oahu to Kauai, but miss Maui? Um, those are all questions we have. Another effort has been um, aerial sampling for of imagery, uh, remote sensing imagery from aircraft. Um, Greg Asner and the Global Airborne Observatory, they have a program of um, using both LIDAR and hyperspectral imagery to sample things. And with a lot of effort, what they were able to do is figure out the spectral signature of an OHIA that showed rod symptoms. So they looked at, here's the signature of Ohia, here's browning Ohia, here's the brown Ohia, here's the spectral signature of it. And by doing that, they were able to fly the entire island and map all the trees that were showing rod symptoms. So this is a map from 2019 of all the trees during the week that they flew the island, they were showing rod symptoms. Now, not all these trees are rod. Like we said, there are other trees that turn, other reasons trees might turn brown but it pretty much shows you a distribution of where the trees are. Now, in order to make a map that you can look at on one page, they mapped each tree as if we're 400 feet across, which isn't so. So this map makes it look worse than it is, but you can kind of see, you can see the lines here and that's the planes uh, flight paths that it did. But you can kind of see where the rod is on the island. So you can see here, you can see there's a, a bunch in sort of Wood Valley area. There's a big outbreak in Kona above Honau now. Um, some in Puna, a lot down in, um, and a little bit getting up into the Yellow Forest Reserve. This, um, this is an expensive undertaking. It costs about a, a quarter million dollars to get the airplane, fly everything, get all the imagery, spend all the airtime um, to do it, and then to analyze it all to produce these maps. But they've done it at four different times. And by doing it, they're able to count how many trees at any given time are brown. And then by our ground level observations, we have data on how long a given tree stays brown. So, you know, really it's about three months. Um, so our estimates here now are that, well, if a tree stays brown for about three months and you pick up, roughly they've been picking up about 50,000 trees a year uh, for each flight. But if they only stay brown for three months, we figure four times that. Uh, so about 200,000 trees a year or our end estimate is over a million ohia have died from rod because of this. So the good news is we're not getting more and more. We're not getting 50, 100, 200, 400,000 trees per flight. We're getting the same amount of trees dying each year. So kind of a level of mortality. Um, the bad news is um, that it does seem to be moving and moving more uphill into more pristine areas. Um, and then skipping to other islands is, is still really still a puzzle of how it's moving around. So if you look at the 2017 map, you see a lot of mortality in Puna, which is what we originally saw, where we originally saw the, the disease. 
if you look at the 2019 map, you actually see less. And I think a lot of that is because the, the vulnerable trees died. Now, we, at least on the Big Island, remember, we got hit by a hurricane in 2014. So late 2014. So in 2015, there were a lot of injured trees. A lot of those died in a big wave of mortality. And I think that's why we saw that wave of mortality. Um, by 2019, it was petering out. But in 2019, we are seeing more um, mortality in the upper watershed areas. So good news, bad news. We're not out of the woods yet, but it's not as bad as it could be. Now, what I was just showing you was airplane mounted remote sensing that is done once a year. Drones have great advantages in a drone. Flying a drone is cheap. You get two folks in a pickup and a drone and you could, hey, it looks like a good morning. Fly it out, go out to a site and throw the drone in the air and get your imagery right then. Um, Ryan Proy at UH Hilo. Oh, I need to correct this slide because he's got six sites going on now. Ryan Proy at UH Hilo is also able to use his drones to find, and these are pictures of what the drone sees, these brown canopy rod trees. In, in addition to a lot of things, what he has is sites where he's been able to map um, it many times by going every month over the period of several years um, to map in a given area how many trees have died. So here is um, a certain area down by Kapapala and showing a map of dead trees, June 2010, from some other imagery that he got. He did repeated images over that, and by 2018, you're able to show how many trees have died. So you get this sequence of how the trees are dying in a given infected stand. If you graph that out, what you see here is that what will happen is the in the stand, the infection will start out low, it'll grow exponentially, and then it'll taper off. So you get the sigmoidal pattern of it. Um, so what we think goes on is something happens to predispose that stand like a windstorm or, or some activity in the stand that injures the trees. And then a whole lot of trees all get infected. They die off at different rates because the different trees will get different levels of infection. And so some will die quicker, some will die slower. And then when that event passes, it tapers off again. Um, it, the, the level of mortality tapers off again. Now, what we're not seeing is it doesn't seem to stop you still get mortality in it. But what we're seeing is, and so these are three different stands, um, a, three different stands. The blue line is along Stainback Highway. Um, the red line is in Kau there. And then the green line is Waipunalei, which is um, up on the, the Hamakua coast. So we're seeing there these patterns, you get these exponential increases, and then they kind of level off in mortality, which is telling us something about what goes on in the forest and how we can manage it. One of Ryan's other projects, which is cool, is uh, Kukuau, which is his word for the drone sampler. So this is a drone sampler, and there's a, a fancier version of this out now. But sometimes getting to these trees to sample is really hard, um, and especially on the neighbor islands like Kauai, where it's on top of some inaccessible ridge. Well, they've invented a drone that has, if you see here, it has a, a, a arm on it, and the arm has a clipper. And if you look at this, the clipper goes up, grabs and saws off a branch, um, and then it flies back to the operator with a sample. So that's just a really cool thing. There was an article about it in the Hawaiian Airlines magazine this year. And uh, sadly, people aren't flying Hawaiian, so they didn't see the article, but it's definitely cool technology um, that would enable the, instead of spending a day to bash into the woods to find a tree, you could fly a drone over and get some samples in 20 minutes and bring it back. Flint Hughes with the Forest Service has been um, setting out plots in the forest um, to look at Ohia um, and gotten a lot of information. He's got something like 200 plots. Some of them have been there for five years. One of the pieces of information he's got in there is smaller trees have a much lower level of mortality than the larger trees. That um, these little guys that are about, you know, on the new lava fields, only about 5% mortality per year in plots that are infected. Whereas the big trees in the plots that they're in infection, they're seeing 13% mortality a year. And what we think is going on here is the little small whippy trees don't get broken branches as much as the big old trees. And so they're less prone to injury um, than the bigger trees. Another really interesting result he found was that um, they found seedlings at plots that were above 3,000 feet elevation. But below 3,000 feet elevation, they're not finding any seedlings. 
um, because the weeds crowd them out. You get everything is up in palm grass and clademia and everything else like that. Um, so what that tells us, the big question is, is the forest resilient? Can it recover? And in the areas that are above 3,000 feet are more pristine forests. The ohia can recover, it can grow back. Whereas in the areas that are down around 1,000 foot elevation, once the ohia is gone, the weeds are going to take over and the forest cannot bounce back from the double whammy of weeds and from rot. I mentioned one of the things that we are looking at is um, concern about people moving around is moving around wood. Uh, in Ohia, posts and poles are used to move around. Um, and I'll um, discuss this briefly. We do know that heat treatments kill the logs. And so um, this is Jenny Juswick again with, um, that's actually Blaine Louise who's working on the project here, um, did tests of infected logs, instrumenting them up and putting them in the kiln and what they found is if you heat the logs themselves up to 140 degrees F, you'll kill all the fungus in the log. And so the, moving that log around is not a, a concern anymore as far as moving infection around. So this in a kiln works for a little balustrade post like this, but what about a big log? Well, big log is gonna be a much harder thing to heat up in a kiln. Um, there was a project where we were using um, a project where these guys from the mainland brought a vacuum steam kiln, which is this heavy duty kiln that is, um, they vacuum the air out and blast steam in it. And it turned out that this kiln also was able to heat up a log overnight and kill all the fungus in it. So when they ran infected logs through it, they found that um, overnight it was heated up to a point where all the fungus was killed. And this involved weeks and weeks of sampling and cutting these logs up into thousands of samples and taking in all that. So there are treatments now available for treating logs um, that hopefully we will not uh, be moving the pathogen around inner island by moving logs around. Um, and there's another trial that we're doing on that. Could we soak the logs in fungus, fungicide? And the short answer to that is that doesn't seem to work. A wood chip soaked in fungicide, it will kill the fungus, but the fungicides don't soak into logs in any reasonable time because oh, he is such a hard wood. So we're back to the heating things. Then one other question people ask is, can we protect, can we treat live trees? Um, now this tree is, this is an elm tree in New Hampshire. Um, this tree is treated every other year with fungicides to prevent Dutch elm disease from killing the tree. Um, this would be a treatment that you could do to landscaping trees, individual trees that you wanted to save um, if it worked, but it's not a forestry level technique. So in the trials, what we did was we injected the fungicide propoconazole into trees um, as a protection and then inoculated the trees of the pathogen. Now it's a lot of work and a lot of fungicide, it takes half an hour to inject a tree to do it. Unfortunately, the results for this are mixed. Um, what we found was that um, at the high elevation site, um, all the fungicide protected trees lived, which is good, but a bunch of the ones that were the control trees also lived. And what that tells us is that these high elevations, and this was at 5,500 feet, um, the disease just doesn't progress very well. So did the fungicide make a difference? That's still out to the jury. At the low elevation site, even a bunch of the fungicide protected trees um, died. Uh, so it might have delayed the disease a little bit, but that's not really, it's not, we're not ready to roll with this yet. It, we're not, we have, we don't have any evidence that you're not doing more harm than good by doing this. So that was a trial, but it wasn't working. Summary, how do we protect the trees? Don't move ohia wood around unless you treat it. Don't wound ohia trees. And we have ongoing issues with heavy equipment, pruning, trail marking, trail marking, people using a machete to blaze where they're going in the woods. We've seen diseased trees with that. Decon your vehicles, uh, decon your boots. Uh, I think everybody here has been through that thing. Rubbing alcohol is the, um, but first clean off all the mud. Rubbing alcohol doesn't do any good on top of mud. Uh, clean off all the mud and then uh, use your rubbing alcohol uh, on your clean surfaces, on your shoes. Your vehicles, just clean the mud out of them. That's the best thing to do. And that gets rid of your weed seeds, your little fire ants, God forbid, anything else that's in your truck before you go up to pristine areas again. We put out a new five-year strategic response plan. It's on our website if you want to dig deeper into this. And I do want to reiterate that most of our forests are still healthy and we want to protect them and keep them that way. Thank you for listening and thank you to all our funders. 
um, a lot of different funders that have funded this, both from the private and the public sector. And there is our contact information. Um, I'm the Extension Force and Hoku Pihana is our specialist on that. We are on the web at rapidohiadeath.org. We're on Facebook at Rapid Ohia Death. And we're on Instagram at Ohia Life. 